Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. This morning, uh, after our ordination and appointing of Jay as an elder last week, I wanted to take the time to go through because there are many who are here who were not part of our process to eldership. And this is a great joy of our lives as a church because the Lord is going to continue to raise up other men who will serve as elders in this body, shepherd leaders. If you think of elder, think of shepherd. Uh, Jay summed it up so well last week. It's not a position of lording over anyone. It's a position of stewardship, of shepherding, and everyone is cared for, shepherds and flock, and it is the design of the Lord. So as we go through this this morning, this is, uh, we, we, we moved into eldership as a commitment to obey God's word, really at all costs, that when we see something in scripture, that whether it be personally, individually, or corporately, that we adjust, that we do. What does the Bible say? Do we understand what the Bible has said? Then how, and this is our application from every Bible study, every scripture reading, every devotional, how do I put that into practice in my life? And when we talk about a church family, how do we put that into practice? How do we implement that into our lives? And that is the healthiest place to be. That is the safest place to be. That is the place where God's blessing is poured out on his people. And when God's people are healthy, when the infrastructure of the church is right and righteous and pleasing to God, then guess what will happen in the world around us? It won't be a display of dysfunction and jealousy and backbiting and gossip. It will be a display of the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, and his church will represent him well at home, in home, in conversations between husbands and wives, and what children look at and observe as they are being brought up, and how they see their, ch- their parents honor the Lord, love the church, invest their lives into the church, lay their lives and their schedules down for the church and their kids will get a taste of the glory of God and then they will come to love the church. It's our only hope to pass it on to the next generation. It's a complete abandon to the will of God, the glory of God, and that is in essence what sin is. It's the opposite of that. It's I want the glory for me. I want to do, I will do this, I will do that, I will go here, I will go there because I have to, I want to. And it's the opposite of we exist to glorify, fill it in, God. That's why we were made. So it's actually, and Stephen prayed it this morning, that's where our greatest joy is. How many times we hit a dead end and we're in bitterness and we think God has let us down. Maybe he's calling us back to the place where his blessing is poured out, a place of obedience. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, where we see the church as it is just, be, it's just exploding, it's growing. There's a need for leaders in Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders, there it is, plurality, for them in every church, They're a gift to the church. With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is the word of the Lord, and we're going to unpack this, and we're going to move through this this morning in a way that I trust will be helpful to us as a congregation, to every every single member of the congregation. What are the four biblical requirements for appointing elders in the church. That's what we want to look at this morning. This is bathed in prayer. This is part of our five distinctives. This is, if we are going to be effective in purposefully making disciples, then there has to be a healthy leadership in the congregation. Tony Evans says, if there's a, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pews. 
So being clear on this, number one, elders must be called. Elders must be called. And this is uh, last year, many of the guys, we, we gathered on Saturdays. We went through Paul's you know, instruction to elders because as a pastor, as an elder, I want for every man in the congregation, whether you're called or not, and, and so let's, let's not confuse that if you're an elder, then you're, you're a, a special Christian. You're, you're up here, and then everybody else is here. So just destroy that idea, okay? In, in the kingdom, it's actually upside down. You actually just surrender to serve. It, it's not over, lording over, it's actually serving under Jesus, and that's the safest place for us to be. So in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, the saying is trustworthy, Paul writes to Timothy, if anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. There's a calling that God gives into someone's heart and life, that a desire, and that's healthy. That's a good thing. It's, it's, it's placed by the Lord. So an elder must be called, but first of all, they must be called to salvation. You say, well, pastor, isn't that a kind of a given that a pastor, that an elder should be saved? Well, you would think so. But there are many times where somebody is simply charismatic. They're a good speaker. They're funny. They can attract a crowd. They're very gifted organizationally at leading, at building, and people follow, and it's exciting, that doesn't mean that they're saved. That doesn't mean that they belong to Christ. Now, the Lord knows she truly belongs to him. But this is important. Matter of fact, we'll see it in one of the qualifications. Someone considered for an elder to serve as an elder cannot be a new convert. It's dangerous for them. They have to have time to grow up. They have to have time to get their spiritual bearing, their, their roots to sink down because it, it's challenging, it's difficult, and, and you don't want somebody misunderstanding what eldership is and, and I can get in there and I can get, no. They need to grow up, they need to be observed and watched. They must be called to salvation and they also must be called to ministry. That's what Timothy is writing or, or receiving from Paul. The ministry of serving as an, as an elder, as a pastor, uh, to those who, I, there was an older preacher and to younger preachers, you know, he said, hey, if you can do anything else other than preach, do it. If you can't do it, if you're called, then you can't do anything else with your livelihood. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't go through seasons. I've been in seasons, you know, before coming here, I was in a season working at the GM outpost for company cars, thinking, Lord, <laughs> I'm in the wilderness here, you know? Ginger was working nights. I was working mornings. We handed off the kids at a babysitter, waiting on the Lord to, you know, open the door. And he did. Praise the Lord. I still remember pulling in and parking right out here, you know, on the back of the parking lot, like, where's the gym in this place? You know, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can serve without a gymnasium. I got to have a place to stay in shape, but we've survived so far, pretty much. My ankles have been spared, I do believe, from twisting them playing basketball. A call to ministry, an individual must be surrendered to the Lord Jesus over and above everything else that the Holy Spirit gives them a desire to serve as an elder in the church, that they're gifted by the Holy Spirit for the responsibilities of the ministry. So they're called, they're equipped, they're faithful, and, and you observe them serving in all of the different ways. It's a process. Secondly, elders must be qualified, not just called, but they also must be qualified. But 1 Timothy 3, if you're there in your Bibles, we're going to look at verses 2 down through 7. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, we'll explain that in a little bit, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, 
not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, if you go to Titus, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, it's just to the right near Bible. Titus, Paul writes, and these younger preachers than Paul were different, all right? Timothy is often a, maybe more timid. Titus is a little more uh, bold of a guy. Great name for a kid if anybody's going to have a son, you know, Titus. But in Titus chapter 1, in verse 6, okay, so Titus has a job. Verse 5, Paul says, I left you in Crete. So you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Then he gives the qualifications. So there again, we see the plurality of the elders, multiple elders in the church in every town. If anyone is above reproach, verse 6, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now go back with me to the left to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're just going to look at verses 11 and 12. In this context, the gifts that the Lord has given to the church. Some of these gifts are people uh, in serving in various offices for the church. Ephesians 4 and verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, you could say they're missionaries, right? church planting, evangelists. The shepherds, same word as pastors, and teachers. Why? For what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. And the rest of that section, I want to spend time in, but we're not going to do it today. And I'm thinking, you know, we haven't preached through Ephesians yet. Maybe, maybe that one's got to come on the radar after Nehemiah. I don't know. We'll see. But there's so much there because there's a footing that we need to have. We need to grow up, and, the, and the, we want the whole church to grow up. We want everybody, ev- all ages, to be strong and sound and not be taken in by false teaching, a false doctrine. So the 17 qualifications that we've seen here in these, just these three passages, the first qualification is this, that the man of God must be blameless, blameless. Now, let me say at the outset, as you're filling these in, okay, this is not us versus them. Okay, so this is Russ and Jay and Brian. I'm going to be watching and make sure this is for them, and I will let them know if they screw up. I'm going, to t- I'm going to be watching. This is actually for every child of God. This is for all believers. So you're not off the hot seat, all right? If you're a Christian, this is you too, but the Lord actually gives children, parents, that they can mimic and walk and follow And they do that all too well, often in not all of the areas we wanted them to mimic and follow us in. So that's that's part of it. And in the church, it's the same way. Well, what does it look like to follow Jesus? Well, Jesus is perfect and nobody else. But when we follow him, we're going to see the direction. And it gives an example. And that's how discipleship happens. 
you make disciples by helping someone else follow Jesus. How are you going to help them? Well, it implies you're following Jesus. You're growing in grace. You're learning more of forgiveness and all of God's mercy, and you're sharing what you're learning, and that's how we make disciples. So they must be blameless, and this, this means above reproach. It's not sinless, because if that was qualification number one, must be sinless, Okay, I'll see you later. I find somebody. There's not anybody else coming. Blameless, the idea is that even if someone makes an accusation, and oh yes, in all the years of ministry, there have been accusations made, but when you live a long time with a group of people who love you and they know your imperfections and your faults and your weaknesses, but then someone makes an accusation of, of being sinful, rebellious, insubordinate, then the people that know that individual say, no, I know, I know he's not perfect, but he's not that. I know him. And I don't hold him as, here's Jesus and then our pastor, or this is an issue with a Catholic priest has been ordained and given a special measure of grace, not according to Scripture. Every man of God, woman of God, child of God needs Jesus, right? We're all on the same level. But this is where if accusations are made, they don't stick. So keep that in mind with blameless. Secondly, they must be temperate. That is that the elder, the, the pastor, the man of God must be well-balanced, alert, watchful, clear-headed. Those are all words for temperate. Why? Because you're walking through a minefield. There's a minefield in my own heart, in my own family, in our community and world. So you need someone who's temperate. So if you think back to the Old Testament, at the inauguration of the tabernacle and the priests, sons, Aaron's sons, they offered a profane fire and God killed them and told Aaron, you can't mourn for them because they offered to me fire that I didn't give. They're trying to worship me their way, so carry them out, carry on in your duty, and then followed up in that is, and don't let them be ever drinking when they come in service. So how that connects together, I don't know how it all connects together. If they just were ignorant in what they did, if they were drunk in what they did, and they weren't temperate, they weren't there. They weren't present. They weren't clear-headed. And they came stumbling into the presence of the Lord as if it was an idol temple and it just doesn't matter because that thing ain't going to do anything anyway. And the Lord needed to separate between his worship and all other false worship. Well, that got the attention. So did it in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira lied in the house of God really kind of at the inauguration of the church and the Lord struck Ananias and Sapphira and they died. And the fear of God went out through all of the people saying, we're worshiping not like the pagans are worshiping, we're worshiping the one true and living God. And he sees all and he knows all and he's merciful far beyond what we deserve. And Peter knew that. Peter knew that. Thirdly, they must be sober-minded. Sober-minded. It must be disciplined in his priorities. Sober-minded. Fourthly, the man of God must be of good behavior. That is, he leads an orderly life. There's a reputation here that is godly, righteous. That when you think about it as being sober-minded in their priorities, there's an importance of prioritizing. Understand, my first ministry is to my family. I grew up hearing, went to college hearing, if you lose your family, you lose your ministry. Those words stuck with me, but I'll be honest with you, growing up in ministry as a youth pastor and even coming here, 
I had a lot to work out and understanding of what does that look like then to not have an entire congregation set my schedule. How do I prioritize ministering to my family and ministering to the family of God? Let me tell you, in eldership, there are other eyes right immediately looking in on that management of time and family so that nothing is neglected, so that no one is neglected. And often that is the case of those who grow up in pastor's homes is they, they have a sense of, my dad was there for everybody else and I don't think he knows me. And it's too often, children grow up in a ministry home and they walk away from church saying, I don't want any more to do with that. They've seen all the behind the scenes from people to pastor, from pastor to family, and they say, I'm out. No more. This man must be of good behavior. Number five, he must be hospitable. That he receives others graciously. Just has an open, open house. Now, this is highly connected to a man's wife. You know, being able to receive guests and company and it not be imposing, but actually the joy for the couple to open their home, receive others in, and that's just a mingling of lives where you kind of see behind the scenes, is it the same as what you see Sunday to Sunday? Number six, not addicted to wine. He's not, a, not an abuser of substances, so this wouldn't just be you know, alcohol, but this would be really not addicted to any substance. It doesn't say that they cannot drink, but it says not addicted. Not, it really, in the, in the Greek, not, does not stay long at the wine. Right? At the bottle, just, just nursing it long time, which leads to drunkenness. Okay? So again, this is for the man of God. This is also for the people of God. Not violent, number seven. Able to demonstrate self-control in difficult situations. Oh yeah, family rides with me in traffic too. Neighbors live around me. Things, things go wrong. How, how does the person respond when things go wrong? You know, are they, was it fist to cuffs, you know, just immediately ready to exchange blows? Okay, again, this is for the men of God, but this is also for the people of God. I keep, I keep bringing it back to bear on, on you as well because it helps you to think through it and it helps you to pray for us as well. Number eight, not greedy for money, not covetous, not greedy for dishonest gain, but content. I praise God for the reputation of this congregation for we're approaching 60 years and the church has managed its resources throughout our history, praise the Lord for that. Can I just say I'm thankful for how the congregation takes care of me and my family? That, that's part of your giving is people. It's not just buildings and the things that needs to be done. When you give, it's worship, and you are, you are saying by your giving Lord, thank you for Ephesians for your gifts to the church. See, it, it comes down to when, when you give and you are actually reflecting back on how thankful am I for the person, the men that God has placed in my life who teach me the word of God, who shepherd me. And I have, not, not really well organized, but I got files and boxes and envelopes of cards. I believe almost every card ever given to me. I'm like a pack rat on those. 
And I just, I, every now and then, I'll just pull them out and read them and just be encouraged. But if somebody is using ministry because on the side, I have this business, you know, this construction business, and the more people that come to church, I can slip them a business card for whatever, the newest thing I'm selling or the other thing or the other thing, and I can build my downline. So over the years, what, 26 years in ministry, there's been a lot of opportunities to get into something and sell something. And Ginger and I have said, thank you, but no. Because I don't want ever people to see me coming saying, oh, great, here he comes. Now, if they say that about me because I'm saying, hey, I've been missing you in church, I'm okay with that. If it's, you know, I've been praying for you, thinking of you, and I see you again, I'm okay with that. But not for, oh, he's going to want me to, you know, his new whatever business, the next venture. No, no, we're not doing that. Number nine, gentle. Gentle. They're considerate. They're gracious. They're quick to pardon failure without holding grudges. Ouch. Do you know of the difficulties in ministry God has? God has been so good to restore even difficult situations in ministry. This is only the third church I've been in. Do you realize what a gift it is, a grace from the Lord that I've been able to go back to those two prior churches and that there is a level of fellowship while I'm not still held responsible for shepherding those two congregations? I, I, we just went back to Illinois in November for the wedding and uh, one of our kids, all these years he was waiting, got married and uh, got to fill the pulpit there. Now they've called a pastor, someone who was there serving before. Praise God for that. But I'm, I'm not responsible for them. But that's such a gift of God's grace to go back. It's a gift of God's grace to pass people. They even have been in fellowship here as members and have parted ways, but to see them and when the air is clear, but to just extend forgiveness. And if anybody is watching that used to be here, I want everyone to understand I'm not holding grudges over anyone who was here. I still think of and pray, and the Lord brings to mind passing, you know, at Kroger. Everybody's at Kroger, you know, you're going to see him there. Wherever we go, I still want God's best for every person that's been in and through this congregation. And if you've known me long enough, I think you can say, I don't think he's lying. I believe that to be true. It is. I want God's best. And it doesn't mean I don't miss people that have left. I didn't have that in my notes. <laughs> Peacemaker, number 10. Strives. <coughs> Strives for peace. But stands, and understand this, this is not a peace faker. A peace faker is a person who will compromise and they will not say what needs to be said because they don't want to offend somebody. Oh, you know, they're a longtime member. I can't say that. So I have to fake peace. No. A peacemaker, not a peace breaker. Oh, I just tell it like it is, as if it's a badge of honor. No, it's not. A peacemaker is, how do I speak the truth in love? How do I say what needs to be said the right way so that the heart gets it and change happens and it really is an extension of the change that God has done in me and is doing in me and I want that for others. I want them to know the grace and mercy and goodness of God and live in God's blessing. So if we're going to be as parents, as spouses in marriage, if we are going to be peacemakers, then we are going to have to learn to communicate. We're going to have to learn to speak the difficult things and share the intimate things, the hidden things, in a way that is gracious, that is kind, that is true, 
that is faithful, that is loving. And from time to time, somebody will come in and say, Pastor, we're elders. Can we sit down? Can we talk? We have questions. Do you know what a joy that is when somebody is simply making for peace? I just want to better understand. I want to know, will you help me? Oh, that is a whole different ball game. That's family. That's real. That's legitimate. That's good. That's healthy. I thank God for that. Number 11, respectable. This is a, a good testimony, but, but not just in the church. This is also neighbors. Um, as elders, where they work in the community, that people know them to be trustworthy, know them to have integrity, know them to be honest, know them to be diligent, good stewards wherever they are and whatever they do, that people outside of the community, if you say, hey, uh, yeah, I'm an elder, they don't say, you? What? No way. Are you kidding me? Do they know you? Okay, so this is a, a good testimony. This develops over time. This is respectable. A good testimony in the community. Listen, I, just this week, just this week, something happened. I got a call as a chaplain. And uh, this is one of those little blessings from being somewhere for a long time that just, you just don't get if you are you know, two, three years and then off to the next church and off to the next church and the next church. And a call came in, they got the wrong chaplain. I was like, that's okay, I'll, I'll go, I had time. This has been one thing that's been helpful, not driving the school bus anymore, is that there is more time for these kinds of important things. So I got the call, so I you know, got on my chaplain coat, went to the address, walk in the door, and there's somebody from our community, somebody that has even attended here years, years, years ago. And in that moment, there was a, an exchange that was, they, they were almost relieved of a familiar face in a difficult time. And th you just don't get that in just a, you know, just a little time, a little time, a little time. It happens over, the Lord is working in people's lives in and through our community for day by day, week after week, month, years, now decades it's the long haul of ministry. And that's a good thing. We're long past the honeymoon stage of ministry. We're living life together. Number 12, husband to one wife. Now, guys, when we were together, someone at our, at our table said, check, there it is, I've got that one. Well, there's a little problem with this and because it doesn't mean that if you're a single person, you can't serve as an elder. Paul was single. Uh, Timothy didn't have a wife yet. It means a one-woman man. It means that everybody who knows that man, they know that man is totally devoted to his wife, and that's it. He doesn't joke about, hey, check her out over there. Uh, it's not your wife, and furthermore, if that was your wife, that'd be weird. <laughs> you know? So everybody that knows that individual, and again, let me say this again, this isn't just for the elders. It's not just for a pastor. This is all men of God, listen to me, young men as you're growing up, to be devoted. Now, what's one absolute destroyer of this is pornography. That wreaks havoc on this. So this isn't just what other people say about you as well, that men, this is also what God sees and knows to be true about what is often every man's battle and the prevalence of it and how that, how that sets up a relationship in marriage with false expectations and the Lord in his grace can actually work through and redeem those aspects of our lives just like he did for David. But everyone that knows, well, myself, Russ, Jay next door. Did you love that Jay didn't have it written in, but he looked at his wife and said, I love you, Mary. That's it. 
And everyone knew, and his kids were like, ah, I don't think so. And they're like, yeah, he does. He does. He loves his wife. A one-woman man. Number 13, and that, it also doesn't mean that if something would happen and a wife would pass away, that that man couldn't marry because you just had one and that's it. Okay? That comes under uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul writing. Okay, so just to fully understand, it means this individual is devoted to his wife. If they are single, it means that they are waiting for, if God will give them a wife, then it doesn't mean they have to be married. But again, nowhere in Scripture is it commanded for men in ministry to not be married. It's actually, Paul writes to Timothy, that's a, that's a doctrine from hell that would ever withhold marriage from someone. That's a doctrine of demons. Because you would place a man in the middle of people living out their lives in family and say, oh, this is God's gift to men, to all men, all humanity, and you can't have it. God didn't say that. So that's destructive to those men. That's hurtful to those men to say, you can't marry. It goes against Scripture. So it really matters that we understand the Bible and we believe, is this God's word or do I trust the word of a man? Because whenever we disobey God's word, it hurts people. Let's keep that, let's keep that in mind. Number 13, manages his own household well. That is, he leads. He loves his wife and his children. He leads them rightly. He leads them in a way that is right. So he manages his own household well. This changes in stages of life, you know, when your children are small. They're growing up, the challenges, all of our families are different. Our parenting styles are different. Our children are different. You know that? You can have two kids and they're like totally different. Okay, so in the context of the church, it doesn't mean that you have perfect children. You know, and your children walk in and everybody's like, let's be watching the children today. Let's see if our man is still qualified or not. Let's, oh, that kid, you know, wasn't singing loud enough. He, you're done, pastor. You gotta find a new job. Okay, no, that's not it. It's in the long haul of life. Do you see a faithful shepherding of that man with his family? Or is he only concerned about everybody else's family? Point out all error, you know, you know, and you and you. Uh, is he shepherding his family? And that doesn't mean he's solving every single conflict with his children and, 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 and they don't ever mess up or make mistakes or, or do things wrong. no. But do you see him faithfully investing, praying, humbly seeking help when needing help, and walking through life together in the community of believers? See, this is where there's oxygen to breathe, and we're not faking or pretending like we have to have perfect families. And that people can go at it against a pastor because, you know, your kid and, and whatever and this and that. No. And this is where then everybody in the congregation can say, so you mean there's room for me to make mistakes parenting? Yes, but here's the difference. Are you standing behind those mistakes? Are you sticking with it because that's the way you were brought up and that's the way you know and that's just the way it's gonna be and there's not gonna be any change? Does that sound like a humble servant of God? We can invite the counsel of others in our lives. Hey, help me out here. I'm getting challenged. What do you say? What do you see? Can you help me? And who would you do that with? People that you're walking together in life with. Not everybody. People you trust. People that you would desire their advice because you've seen it acted out, lived out in their family, and you know they're not perfect and their family isn't perfect, but you see something refreshing about their family, and you just simply say, and they will offer it without saying, now I have all, all the rights to tell you what to do in parenting. No, 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 no. We've had that. I've had that. I've had people say, you can't do that with your kids, and you shouldn't let this in, and there shouldn't be dating, and there shouldn't be all these things. Here's the deal, church. There's different realms of authority. Moms and dads, in your home, God's given you authority in that home. 
The church cannot come in and displace your authority. We can help you, love, support, encourage, but we can't, we can't displace you. And some people want that. They want the youth group to be the, you know, have that person take care of the discipleship for me. And if it doesn't work, it's a youth pastor or lack thereof. The church has a realm of authority. And it doesn't come down to telling you everything to do with your children. It can set before you, this is right, this is righteous. The government, institution by God, has a realm of authority, and we're living in a day when the government is overstepping its authority all the time. Why would we think that would be, where'd this come from? Because the lights are going out in the culture. So we as the people of God have to know how do we let our light shine so that other people see our good works and ultimately they glorify our Father in heaven. That's the overarching goal. Not our freedom, not our banners, not anything else, but that they come to glorify God and God is sovereign over everyone and everything. But there's a realm and every person, every parent, every pastor and every government politician will stand before God one day and they will give an account to the creator in whose image they were made and they will give an account for how they fulfilled and stewarded the office that they were entrusted with. Don't think that anybody who gets away with it because the media doesn't call it out, God sees everything. He knows everything and nothing escapes his omnipresent and omniscient realm. Number 14, not a new convert. Not a new convert. He must not be a new Christian. So let me say about this. If somebody is new to faith in Christ, if somebody is a new, new member in our congregation, if somebody is a younger man, I've heard this done through ministry, where people have, man, that guy, he'll be the next pastor, and they start talking that way. I've seen it happen where that person gets puffed up, and then they fall, and then they fall out because they can't live up to that expectation of the guy who's been in training for 50 years, and they've been saved for five minutes, and unsuspecting people, uncareful conversation can set somebody who could be on a right course and can hurt them in their discipleship by putting too much on them immediately. So the same thing goes. We wouldn't have someone become an elder in our congregation that is a recent member because we're still getting to know them and they are still getting to know us. And so we're walking together. And so it doesn't mean that they're a second class person. It means there's a process in the eldership part of our process with Jay. Uh, Russ and Jamie and myself, back in 2019, we had prayer with Jay in the side room. And we're in 2022 now. And he didn't get frustrated with the process. He didn't get frustrated, it's taking too long but that we were careful in the process, developing our own process, and that's always going to be in work because we want to always be careful in how we shepherd the flock of God. Patience is there. Number 15, able to teach. They're spiritually gifted and able to teach the Bible. And this is another beautiful thing, and I, this is why we couldn't not, I'm sorry, English teachers, go through this message. Because when someone stands up and they speak, the, the standard isn't, oh, that's different than wise. Yeah, it's gonna be different because we're not making little followers of wise, right? We're making followers of Jesus Christ. And so last week, I was thinking about it as Jay was sharing his testimony, the gospel, God's leading and working in his life. And I'm sitting over here off the side thinking, how God works is there may be somebody's ears who's turned in and they hear him, and I've been saying the same thing for all these years and they're not listening. But through Jay's tongue, it might hit a heart and somebody say, man, I didn't think of it that way. And what's the ultimate goal? That I get the praise. <laughs> You're right, Josh. That God gets the glory. 
that God gets the glory. And when people who are different, when Russ stands up, when Stephen stands up, when someone, then the church isn't putting an expectation there. What is our expectation? Open the book, read it, explain it, and together let's obey it. That's our standard. And so it's going to be different with each person who stands up here. But what isn't going to change is, is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible means? Have you done your work studying? Then let's pray for and encourage one another to obey it. And let's put it into practice because that's where the blessing of God is in our life. So when it's able to teach, it doesn't mean they have to graduate 19 classes and have this and that and the other. It means they can take the word they've proven through leading a small group, teaching in children's ministry and not quitting two times after teaching, right? Like, and, and Jay, where's Jay right now? Teaching. Teaching. It's a great children's ministry, great place to to prove and grow and learn. Because listen, if you can explain it to a kid and they understand, you'll do all right right here, right? That's often the more challenging audience is children. Why? Well, something. Why? Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Ask your mother. Right? Number 16, able to refute error. That's including false teaching and false teachers. They don't, their entire ministry is not devoted to just sniffing out and, and saying, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. No, the better way is to set forth the truth. Here's what's right, okay? And when somebody challenges you, you know what's right, and you can defend it, and you can take them to the book, chapter, and verse, and your opinion isn't, you know, overall, Number 17, takes good care of the church of God. Doesn't forget, it's not, you know, this isn't my church. This is God's church. That is a release of responsibility on one hand, and it is a pressure just in the great responsibility, a reminder of you have an immense responsibility you are shepherding in the church of God. It's his. You're his. So as elders, we will strive to live, to learn in such a way that we remain qualified, that we remain useful in the hand of the Lord. So will you pray for us as you look at this list? Will you pray for us? We need wisdom. We need humility from the Lord. We need boldness and we need love. Because it's not just enough, you, you know, it, it's not like you passed your driver's license test. Here's your license. We'll see you now. And there's an evaluation that's always going to remain qualified. It's just not, there it is, that's done. This is living life together. Elders must be called. Elders must be qualified. Thirdly, elders must be commended. They must be commended, or you could say commissioned. The scriptures teach us that the man of God, the elder, must be in this process of commending, that they must be proven first. Proven. Back in 1 Timothy 5.22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So here, Paul is saying, yeah, Timothy, I know you need help, but, but don't hurry and just put people into, we need, we need somebody in that position. Hurry, go. They have to be proven first. Get to know them. Let them prove out that faithfulness in the little things. You willing to shovel? You willing to serve in children's ministry? You willing to vacuum? You willing to do whatever? Because there's no position that like I don't do that anymore. No, not in the flock of God. Jesus just crushed that one on John 13, washing the disciples' feet. Now, remind me, fellas, I'm paraphrasing here. What is it that you can ever say I'm above that? When Jesus washed their nasty feet? Proven first, commended through fasting and prayer. 
These are essential parts of the process. It led up to the ordination in the early church as they appointed elders. It was part of our process before ordaining anyone in eldership through fasting. It's seeking the Lord. Acts 14, 23, when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Do you see who owns the elders? The Lord. That's what helps in a family when we have issues and conflict and we work out, but we remember. Uh, do you know who owns the flock? The Lord. Do you see the check and balance that's there that's good, that's healthy, that's what we need? We belong to him. We are not our own, but we belong to him in life and in death, both now and forever, right? We're his. We are not our own. And finally, elders must be commended in a plurality. In a plurality. So this is where Titus, listen up. I left you in Crete that you might Put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you, Paul said. There's a plurality. It's not a one-man band. It's not a one-man show. Do you know how beautiful this is that it, then a church doesn't have every expectation for me as a pastor to be everything, be it all, be the good administrator, be the good leader, be the good speaker, uh, be the good financial guy, and be the good, you got to build a church up here pretty soon. You know, Lola said that to me a few weeks ago. How come you guys aren't building? We were pulling out of the office down there. How come you guys aren't building a building out there yet? I was like, I'm getting my tools together. Leave me alone. <laughs> It'd be, be coming along soon, all right? I'm getting it. Just one more tool. But a plurality brings different. You might have somebody who's like, let's do it now. Go, 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 do it. Somebody else is like, well, we'll get around to it sometime down the road. No, you need that plurality coming together, say it's the right time. Let's, let's do it in wisdom. It's the blessing of plurality. Elders must be called, qualified, commended. And fourthly, elders must be Christ-like. They must be like Christ. tall order here. But Peter learned this in 1 Peter. Peter was humbled. He learned what it was to fail miserably. Oh, Lord, everybody else, they'll deny you, but not me. I'm your guy. I mean, my name means rock. I'm the first, the rock, it's me. And he just crumbled under pressure. And Jesus forgave him and restored him, loved him. First Peter chapter five, Peter writes, so I exhort the elders among you, there's the plurality, as a fellow elder, to listen to this, listen to his humility here and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Do you, he's saying, I was there at the crucifixion and resurrection. I was there at the transfiguration on the mount. I saw it all. But do you hear what he says? I'm not better than you all. I'm a fellow elder. That's Peter's words. He doesn't say, I have the keys. I'm the guy. He says, I was there for the suffering and I was there for the glory that was revealed and will be revealed. This is a guy we should listen to. And what is he saying to elders? Number, verse two, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Do you hear the humility coming through in Peter? We have a job to do. 
We have a ministry to fulfill. And he's remembering Jesus. And he sets Jesus as the standard before himself and every other elder that would come in the flock of God, the church of God. And he, we are reminded by scripture that Jesus was a humble servant. He was a humble servant. So the elders, like Peter is doing here, have to set the example for the flock, the congregation to follow, like we see in John 13. And we're reminded of who Jesus is in Philippians chapter two. And in humility, he emptied himself and he became the servant. Jesus was a humble servant and loved ones, Jesus was a good shepherd. He was a good shepherd. So the elders must set a good pattern for the people of God, especially for the young men growing up in the church, that they could follow their example, that they could emulate their example. That's why we're pushing it through in small groups because it's, it's more reflective of more people in different personalities holding to the truth. Jesus was a good shepherd. He was a faithful shepherd. There's a responsibility of all believers to Jesus to honor the chief shepherd this is where the gospel serves as the bedrock of all that we believe and all that we say and all that we do. You realize, loved ones, we do not deserve to have Jesus as our shepherd. We've all sinned. We've all committed treason against the God who created us and God in love and mercy made a way for sinners. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, is our shepherd and this isn't how it normally goes. The shepherd offered, laid down his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus did. He's a good shepherd. And this is a responsibility of the elders to the people to serve the people well, to equip them for the work, for the joy of the ministry. And there's a responsibility of the church members to the elders. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders. Those who spoke the word of God to you, the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Follow their footsteps. Now you say, well, wait a second. If I'm following after a, a human, aren't they going to stumble every now and then? I mean, come on, wise. I've seen you. Most of you I've known for a long time. You've made mistakes. You've done things you shouldn't do. This is where, look at the next, next verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's where we put our attention. It's on Christ. It's Hebrews 13, verse 8. That, yes, the men who are shepherds in the congregation, you follow them, but ultimately our eye is where? It's up. It's on Christ because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So consider the outcome of the ways of those men. But remember, we worship and we serve and we follow ultimately Jesus. And in verse 17, Hebrews 13, 17, he says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give, have to give an account. Let them do this, let them give account with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, I want this verse to just settle in because this is where it's all going. As shepherding the congregation, there's a reason for you to submit to authority rightly, not blindly and not ultimately, but submit rightly and righteously to authority. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? Why? because they're watching out for your souls. That's what's going to last forever. So your employer at work, wherever you go, whatever you're doing is temporary, but those who are given to you as gifts to the church, they're watching out for what is eternal. Your soul will last forever. So whatever your career is outside of the kingdom, eternal work, it has its effect and its time and it will last and it's done. But what you do and what I do for Christ will a hundred years from now, it matters. A million years from now, it still matters. They're watching out for your souls. They will give an account. So let them give account to God over you with joy and not with groaning. Why? Because this is the best place 
for you. We're right back where we started. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean? How can we put it into practice? How can we follow and love and obey Jesus? Where do you find yourself in this process today? These four areas, four biblical requirements, elders must be called, elders must be qualified, commended, and Christ-like. It's humbling, but it's worthwhile. And I love you, Grace Community Church. I'm thankful and humbled to serve as your pastor. Same word for shepherd. Will you pray for myself? Pray for me. Pray for Russ. Pray for Jay. Because this list of these qualifications, that's what we spend time together in a regular way, encouraging one another in these areas, praying for one another in these areas. But I want to take it a step further. Will you be praying for those that God will give in the future to the church? For future generations that we continue to glorify God, magnify Christ, and other people come to know, love, and follow Jesus. Amen? Let's stand together. Wherever you are in that, what is your next step? Take that step. And will you help someone else take that step? Will you reach out, encourage others? What is their next step? Take that step. Help them take that step in following Christ. Father, I thank you for... Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that would forgive a sinner like me, and you would graciously entrust to me a ministry of pointing people to Jesus, Lord. I thank you that you are the same yesterday and forever. I thank you, Lord, for your forgiving and restoring me of all of the times that my heart has wandered and you are faithful. Will you use me? Will you use Russ? Will you use Jay? Will you use our families? Will you use us as a congregation, a church family, the body of Christ to make much of Jesus, Lord? so that others will see that Jesus is worth everything. He's worth giving up everything for because you, Lord Jesus, you conquered death, hell, and the grave. And you are eternal, infinite, unchangeable, perfect in your power and glory, in your wisdom, justice, and truth. And we love you because you loved us first. And that isn't going away ever. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. In whose name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.